I'm glad to be here with you. As I was talking to people on the whole way back and forth, I realized everybody here has an accent but me. <laughs> God is good, isn't he? He probably is going to take my hard accent and translate it to you so you will not lose the words and the message. I see here a lot of people that I know and I'm glad to see them. Yes, amen. And I know that God has things in store for us. Amen. Although I'm happy to be in Florida when in North is snowing. So every time you do these meetings in the winter, do them in Florida. <laughs> <clears throat> I was many years ago in Rom Romania during the construction university. I was in college and I used to go to a <clears throat> uh, church that was pretty big church. But it was in the time when we were not allowed to have seminary. They would get approved about two every other year, basically one a year to go to the seminary. And the security, the police, the secret police would screen them. And there, there were so many conditions. It was almost impossible to be approved to go to the seminary. And uh, <clears throat> basically the old pastors could not get retired. So we had a pastor in our church probably around 89 years old, that he was preaching like this. <laughs> Brothers, <laughs> you think that he would die right there. And some good people slept. And the young did other things that were not so nice. <clears throat> After him, there came a new pastor. Lucian was his name. When he would speak, he had power. People would sit on the tip of the chair. Um, if he would preach for one hour or three hours, don't worry, I'm not going to preach so long. Uh, people would forget the notion of time. As when Jesus spoke, the whole day went by, and second day, and third day, and I mean, he could speak a week, and people would forget about meal, sleep, everything. <clears throat> that young pastor that came, had the spirit, the power of God in him, using him. Well, <clears throat> I want to compare these two situations with what happens in our life today. We talk a lot about God. We know all the formulas. We have all the programs. While, while we do complain, we do have the money too. <laughs> yes. The problem is not the programs. The problem is the power. That's what we miss. And we don't have the power because we don't pray. Not because God doesn't want to give it to us. He is waiting for a long time to give the power to his church. It's because we don't pray. And we do pray formulas. But we don't pray the way we should pray. I'm not talking about you. I don't know you. I'm talking about myself. And I am just talking generally. And you take whatever you think it, it would be appropriate to your need. <clears throat> so... Man, it's powerful. <laughs> so, <clears throat> we do pray, but we don't pray disparate prayers. Disparate prayers doesn't mean to, to, to pray those prayers that don't trust God, but to pray those prayers that never end. To pray those prayers that never end doesn't mean that we repeat the same words again and again as pagans do. It means that we stay in a continual connection with God 24-7. That we realize that without Him we are nothing. And we cannot take one step without God. And that young pastor, this is what he had. A life of prayer. And so, <clears throat> the disciples, they were sent to do some things, to solve some problems. And they came back and they said, we cannot do the miracle. And Jesus said, how long? You remember? How long? How long I am going to just watch you doing nothing and be here with you and for you and like babies? And they said, why could you do it? And basically he says, it goes with prayer and fasting. So, and also he mentions faith. <clears throat> the three of them go together. So, <clears throat> the disciples realized that he prays different because when Jesus would speak, he had power, 
power that would change lives, power that would move mountains, power that would stop the storm, power that would resurrect the dead. He says, and it happens. And the disciples said, Lord, teach us how to pray. Ellen White says, and I have the quotations here, that's the reason I took this booklet with me. I want to, once in a while, to read the quotation to you. They are powerful quotations since we talk about power. <clears throat> she says here in one of the quotations that the greatest de deficiency today in church is power. We don't need program strategies. We need power that comes through prayer. <clears throat> Another quotation, why so many of us are defeated Christians? Aren't we? <clears throat> many times we are. And anyway, I'm, one of them, she says, the science of prayer. I don't want to get you discouraged. Even children can pray and God answers their prayer. Yeah. And you know, you don't know, you don't learn swimming by talking about swimming, you jump in the water. So however you know to pray, just pray and you learn prayer by praying. God answers honest prayers you pray the way you know but you learn to pray as you get closer to god as you spend time with him and the word you learn more and more to pray like him you'll never learn prayer not praying okay so <clears throat> moving on i'm gonna i'm gonna go to another quotation and then go back to the subject if jesus you remember the quotation if jesus our divine example God, perfect, righteous, felt the need to pray day and night. How much more we human, weak, sinful, feeble human beings should pray day and night? It seems we don't know how we are. That's the reason we don't pray enough. That's the reason we don't have power. I'm not talking about power used for own interest. Some people pray just for self. Some people pray just for others. There is nothing wrong to pray for self or for others. As long as we have the connection and we know what he wants, because he wants what's the best for us and for others. But anyway, going back, <clears throat> so we need to pray day and night. And that Paul says that the Holy Spirit has to make intercession because we don't even know how to pray. Um, I'm not original here. What I say, it's coming first from the Bible and secondly from other speakers that I respect and like a lot. So I got ideas from all over, but I want to go in detail, explain them and give examples to make them relevant to you. So I'm going to pick a few ideas from De Dr. Derek Morris. And then I'm going to pick a few ideas and I could give you the names. <clears throat> I'm going to go a little through the Lord's Prayer. Okay, just a few thoughts to open a little the perspective. And I'm going to say this when we say teach us how to pray. Many times. We got to be careful what we ask because he may answer and we not, may not be ready for the answer. <laughs> yes. <clears throat> I was praying this prayer, Lord, teach me how to pray. Since I was a kid, my father, I would wake up and he was praying. I would go to sleep and he was praying. I would come home and he was praying. I would leave home and he was praying. And I asked him, when do you sleep? <clears throat> and he said, in between prayers. <laughs> and he didn't, yes. One time he told me, I don't have time not to pray. And he was busy. He was busy, as we are. <clears throat> anyway, let's go to the subject. Let's, let's go into the subject. For instance, in one occasion, I was driving to the gas station, and there was a gas crisis in Romania. We would get 10 gallons a month, and that's it. It was 40 liters a month. And you used it, you don't drive. And I had to go to the pastor's meeting. And I, I, I went to the gas station and I would have to wait in the line to get my ratio, my 10 gallons. And uh, the gas station was outside the city limits. That night, before going to the gas station in the morning, I prayed and I spent time in prayer and I asked God to wake me up early in the morning so I could spend time with him. I will not start the day without God. And I remember specifically that night asking God that he would not bless my plans and my day, but he would show me the plans he has for me for that day. Like in Jeremiah 29, 11, I know the plans I have for you. It doesn't just refer to the life 
plan that he has for you. But it also refers to everyday plan. If you remember, Jesus, every morning he would ask God, he would ask his father, the plan, the agenda for the day. So I said, God, whatever plan you have for today, please show me because I want to serve you. And I remember that specific night, God woke me up around 3 a.m. having a dream. And I don't dream. My mom, she dreams. Ladies sometimes dream. I don't dream. I sleep like a baby. When I put my head down, it takes me less than a second and I know nothing. <clears throat> so I woke up crying and my wife says, honey, are you okay? I said, this is the dream that I had. I was driving to the gas station and I hit a kid with my car. And the kid died and he had blood all over. And uh, I said, I could not go back to sleep. And I told her the spot where I hit the kid and everything. And my wife said, yeah, you ate too much and too late last night. <laughs> so I, uh, I went back to sleep. God woke me up around 5.30. I spent time in prayer and study of the word. And then in the morning, uh, I got ready. I got in the car. I drove to the gas station. As I was driving to the gas station, do I speak too fast? Do you need translation? No. Okay. As I was driving to the gas station, there was kind of a long line of cars driving really slow and i watched and looked because i like to pass cars sometimes i drive a little too fast and so as i pulled a little to the left i looked in the front of the line there was a horse pulled wagon some of you may re have read the book already you may know the story just hang there with me so a horse pulled wagon the wagon was full with wood for fire and the the that wagon would go really slow. I mean, to teach you the patience of saints. And you could not pass because there was a curve going right and going left. And there were cars coming. So we had to wait until we would pass the curve. And then when you can see the road, then we could pass the wagon. Okay? Clear so far? Okay. So I was impatient. I am late. I got to go. And so as I was thinking about time and being late, <clears throat> I got to the curve and everybody started to pass the wagon and I changed, the, I had a stick shift car, you know, old junk. And if you know Renault 10, Renault 10 is like a matches box. You keep your knees in your mouth and you cannot move. <clears throat> it had holes in the floor. When I would go to a water puddle, I would lift my legs so I don't get wet. <laughs> yes, I tell you the truth. And <clears throat> so, I passed the wagon, and as I passed the wagon, changed, uh, second, uh, third, and as I was, I didn't even hit 50 kilometers, that's around 30 miles per hour, there was a truck coming from the other direction, and as we approached each other, exactly when we were parallel, when to pass him, a kid jumped from behind the truck, right in front of my bumper, not five or ten feet away, right, bang, right there. I didn't even have time to see him or to push the brake. Bang! I hit him. When I hit him, he went high and then down and I hit him again. And then on the concrete. As he hit the concrete, blood started to come from his ear, his nose, his mouth. And um, for sure, I pushed the brake. My car went a little forward, stopped. All the other cars stopped. Um, in Romania, if you dial 911 and you wait for the ambulance, you better call Pizza Hut because they come faster. So <clears throat> we didn't wait for the ambulance. Another car was a red car, um, stopped. We put the kid in the car, drove to hospital. They said, too late. They put him in a helicopter, flew him to the biggest city that was closed around 20, 30 kilometers away. When we got to hospital, I was driving. I got to hospital too. People were already talking. You know, in a small town, everybody knows everybody. And people love gossiping. It's just food for them, you know. Uh, the Adventist pastor killed that kid, you know. <clears throat> and that kid, it happens that he was handicapped. We called him Mene Mene because he could not speak. He would walk funny like this, you know. <clears throat> and he could not speak. It seems that the kid looked that direction, but he didn't look that direction and he just jumped. He was waiting for the truck to pass and he jumped. Well... <clears throat> started to come in my mind, what is the city going to say about me, about the church? They can hardly wait to criticize the church. I killed a handicapped kid, you know? 
And I started to be worried for the church and for God's honor and for the work there. So I was talking to the doctors and they came and they had the x-ray and he was with those things of life support, machines, whatever, pumping and, you know, all the crazy stuff. And so I talked to the doctor and there were several, about three doctors and nurses and there were all those x-ray things putting on the wall. There is a light behind them. I don't know how to explain. And they would talk and they would say, brain hemorrhage, broken spine in two places, here and here. Broken lung, the right lung, full of blood. He could not breathe. He was gurgling in his own blood. Broken arm, broken hip, broken leg in two places. And while we talked, I said, what are the chances? And the doctor said, zero. Under zero. If there is a number under zero, that's the number. And while we talked, he was gone. So I went by the bed and I started to pray. And the doctor started to laugh. He said, he's dead. I said, I know. <laughs> I can see that. And he said, pastor, too late. I said, not for God. And he said, nobody, not even God can do anything. The kid died. I said, now you are challenging God, not me. And they didn't let me stay. They took the kid to the morgue, covered him, and they sent me home. So my wife and I spent the whole night in prayer, literally the whole night. And we didn't pray for anything that would be concerned to us. We said, Lord, we know you can do it. And we didn't pray those type of, thank you for being with me last night, be with me today, amen. That, that's poetry, that's no prayer. <clears throat> we prayed. Like when you have an accident or your spouse or your kid, we prayed. We prayed and we said, Lord, I got to the point that I said, whatever it takes, and that's a lot. And I said, Lord, if you are willing, take my life. At this second, I am 100% ready to give my life for that kid. Take it and give it to him and do whatever you want to the point that your name would be honored and people would know that you are God and God can do anything. Remember Mary. When the angel said, you'll be pregnant, and I said, I'm a virgin. And the angel said, nothing is impossible with, how much is possible? Nothing. nothing. God can do anything. What is anything? Anything beyond, beyond our imagination, okay? So I said, God, he challenged you. He said that nobody can do anything, not even God. Show him that there is a God in heaven. And use it just for you. Because you are all. We are literally nothing. We don't even deserve to come before you. But we come because you love us. We come in Jesus' merits. And we pray because you said that we should pray in Jesus' merits. And I will accept your, your will. Because I know that you do answer honest prayers. Elena says that there is no honest prayer that would go without answer. Except, last we heard already, he may say yes, and that's an answer. He may say no, and that's an answer. Or he may say not now, just wait. What we don't like, but that's an answer. And later on, we look behind and we say, that was the best answer. We just got to trust him. So we prayed the whole night until 5.30 in the morning when finally we had peace. <clears throat> I could not go to sleep anymore. I got in my car, drove to hospital. I could not have anybody to talk with. The morgue was closed. <clears throat> anyway, around 9 a.m., People came screaming. The doctor who went to the morgue to do the autopsy, yes. when he opened the door, the kids were standing on the, on, on the, <laughs> the kid was standing on the concrete table and he said, I'm hungry. And the doctor, Whoa! run. So he came, the guards, he came, there is a ghost. And the guards came, and they, ah, everybody running. And then all the doctors and all the nurses came, and they took him and put him to machines. And when, I, when they called me inside, this is the x-ray from yesterday, this is the x-ray from today. Brain hemorrhage, no brain hemorrhage. Broken spine, no broken spine. Broken lung, no broken lung. And then here, broken arm, broken arm. 
broken leg, broken leg. And the doctors were disputing. Our machines didn't work yesterday. Yeah. And the other doctor, how do you explain the broken arm? Why did it work there? And then the doctor says, he was in clinical death, whatever that is. And, <clears throat> and I told him, I don't care where he was. He's back. And then the other doctor says, what do, how do you explain the, the hemorrhage and everything and the spine? And, the, how, how? and I told him, he's God. And they said, no, we need to find a scientific explanation. That's what we do, you know. The whole hospital buzzing and talking, the whole town. We had evangelism, 44 people got baptized. And <clears throat> well, even if somebody would be resurrected from the dead, those who don't want to believe, they will try to, to find excuses and explanations. You remember Lazarus came from the dead and they wanted to kill him and Jesus. Because when people don't repent, that's what they do. But we miss power. And this is what the disciples noticed that Jesus had. Teach us how to pray. And Jesus said, in this manner you should pray. And our time already, we, don't, we didn't even start. Okay. 10 three. And Jesus said, in this manner, he didn't say with these words. If he told you that words, I speak extremely fast. If I would speak in Romanian, Romanians would need translation. But, <clears throat> so, I could say the Lord's Prayer in 12, 13 seconds. But, so, if we have to pray without ceasing, how many hundreds of times I would say it in one day? You, you see, it doesn't make much sense. Jesus said, don't repeat the same words like the pagans. Because God knows what you want to say before you say it. In fact, God knows your problems before you had a problem. In fact, he knew your problems before you were born and he had a thousand solutions before you had a problem. So, therefore, we don't need to teach God, this is my problem and this is how to do it. We just need to give him permission to work and to accept his will in total faith and total submission. That's what we need. So, basically, Jesus didn't say with these words. He said, this is the structure. This is the outline. This is the idea behind. And he said, our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. You remember? Sure you do. Kids know it. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. We know the prayer, don't we? We know it so well. Well, how much do we understand the prayer? That's the question. Basically, when he says, our Father in heaven, why doesn't he say, my Father in heaven? That's what we do. Father, you know, it gives us the concept in Greek of sharing everything, being together, sisters, brothers, family, that we should pray for ourselves, but we should pray for others, and we should love the others as we love self. It is reciprocal. Many, too many times we are so concerned for our needs. I mean, we work for self and we dress ourselves and we eat for ourselves and we do everything for ourselves. That Jesus lived for others. It gives us the idea that we need to love the others. When we gossip, when we don't care, that's not what Jesus did. So basically, <clears throat> and I'm glad I don't know you all so I can say whatever I want. <clears throat> so basically, our Father in Heaven says He is everybody's Father and He loves everybody the same. And if you are His kids, you do what He did. And I'm, I'm, I'm going to move fast, okay? Father doesn't say the word Father as we know the word Father or as it is in Greek or in Hebrew. But the, there it's among a few places in the Bible where the nickname is used for Father. That means Papi, Daddy, it shows close relationship, friendship. It shows that that kid spends time with the father. Yeah. I remember I was able to go to my father and tell him even stupid stuff that I did. And my father would give me a hug and says, that's not good, but I did it too. Let me pray for you. I know that God is going to do great things through you. I knew I could speak to my father anything. I knew I could go to him. That's the type of relationship when you go to God and you know he's the God of the universe. But also, you can open your heart and not just give a bunch of nothing, but be honest. Open your emotions, open, 
not live a double life, but tell him exactly who you are and where you are and what you need and what is in your heart. Remember, Job wrestling with God. Why does it happen? I don't understand. And God rebuked him. Who are you to tell me these things? But in the same time, God says to his friends, he was right. Because God understands where you are. So opening to God, because he is the closest friend you can ever have. Okay, so, our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. And that means first praising God. I, I had a, a sister in my previous district in Wisconsin, and she, her husband left her, and uh, her son started to take drugs, and he got in prison, and everything was going wrong. And she got a little sick, and she was almost losing her job. And she prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed and nothing would happen. And uh, I asked her, I, I, I'm not going to say her name. I asked her, what is the problem? And she said, God doesn't answer my prayer. I said, yes, he does answer every prayer. And I said, do you trust him? And she says, I, I want to. Uh, okay, that's an honest answer. I said, you got to trust him. But she said, I don't feel it. I said, you don't need to feel it. You got to take his word for it. You got to make a decision to praise him for the answer that he gave. But I don't see an answer. I said, that's the problem. You want to see it. That's not faith. Faith doesn't see the answer. It's like my kid. Daddy, he was three years old. He could hardly speak. Daddy, I want a motorcycle. Okay. How big? Uh, so big. I said, can we get you one like this? Uh, better than nothing. Okay. So far, so good. And I said, I cannot get you a real one because you are just three. Can I get you a plastic one? Uh, can I ride it? I said, okay, I'm going to get you one that you can ride it. He said, okay, good. And then he said, when? I said, well, tomorrow I go to Hungary. When I come back from my trip, I'm going to get you a motorcycle. He said, I have a motorcycle. I have a motorcycle. And he ran outside and he told all the kids that he already has done deal past tense a motorcycle. And the kids said, bring it down. We want to see it. And he said, oh, it comes tomorrow. <laughs> Do you see the point? And I told her, I said, praise the Lord for the answer. It comes tomorrow. But when you prayed, God answered, and now he's working on it. Let him work on it. It's like Daniel. When you started to pray, I started to work. You remember? So I told her, you need faith. Because without faith, it's impossible to please God. When you get close to him, you got to trust him. You don't go to the doctor, hey, I have headaches. And the doctor says, take this. Nah, I don't trust you. Nonsense. Why do you go after all? Okay, so I told her, you got to trust the Lord and you got to praise him in advance like it was happened already yesterday. Done deal, past tense. You don't even need to worry about it. You give the problem to God and you leave it there. Many times the problem we have is not that God doesn't answer. We don't let it go. Okay, so the, is, the problem is ours, it's not his. Anyway, so she said, so what should I do? I said, praise him for answering your prayer. Don't you think that he loves your husband more than you do? Yes, he does. Don't you think he loves your kid more than you do? Yes, he does. Then praise him for answering your prayer. And how long should I praise him? Every day. You see, she is still praying for them, but now she's praising him. Do you follow? So... How long should I praise him every day? For what? For answering your prayer, for your husband and your kid. And she said, so I should not ask for them. Well, you can ask quickly, but that when you believe, you already praise him. So, Father, I want to remind you about my husband and my kid, but you know what? I know you answer my prayer. Thank you so much. You are so good. I cannot imagine I'm going to spend eternity with them. Oh, Lord, I don't know how you do it, but you are great always. So, Pastor, but if I don't ask and if they perish... And, and if I don't ask and I lose my job, and if I don't ask and I die, and I said, don't worry, I have a nice funeral sermon, I'm going to preach it for your funeral. Said, don't worry, you just <laughs> praise him. <laughs> and so she promised me that day, that next day, instead of lacking faith in her prayer, she's going to praise the Lord. Amen. Remember Psalm 100, enter his gates. Thanksgiving, Thanksgiving and praises, he is worthy. He is worthy our praises. This is the greatest sacrifice, the sacrifice of our praises. And that gives us a lot of strength, doesn't it? So it does good to our faith. It does good. It shows what type of God we have, that we know our God and we trust our God. And He's a great God. He's not weak. And we are not defeated Christians. 
Because the greatest argument you know against Christianity is Christians. They talk about a God that they don't trust. Yeah. Anyway, so next day around 4 p.m. she called me. I said, Pastor, you will not believe. I said, what happened? Did your husband come back? Oh, no, no, no. <laughs> your kid gave up drugs? Oh, no, no. What happened? She said, I praise the Lord. And she said, while I praised him in prayer, I got peace like never before in my whole life of, of being an Adventist. And she said, I got that type of peace that I cannot explain. It seemed to me that I was already in heaven. I said, praise the Lord. And she said, I went to work. And the workers that worked with me for so many years came to me and said, hey, you got a promotion? No. You are bright. You are bright. Remember Moses coming off the mountain? You are bright. What happened? Your husband came back? No. And she said, I spent time praising the Lord in the morning. That's what you to do to your life. By the way, her husband never came back and I am glad he didn't because I met him. She's better off. However, <coughs> however, her son gave up drugs. He's back in church. Amen. <clears throat> so basically, you start praising the Lord and you end praising. For that is the kingdom and you end praising the Lord. Okay. But then you move to the first section. Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Hallowed be thy name. What does he mean? To sanctify his name, doesn't it? Yeah. Well, no. <laughs> to sanctify is hagios. And in the Greek there is hagiazo. That means sanctify your name in my life now. We cannot sanctify. He's already holy. He doesn't need us to make him holy. But basically is, Lord, people cannot see you, but they can see me. Let me represent you to the point that they will see you clearly today. Let me be as you are. Live in me today. Take me away and you come and walk. And you come and talk. And you come and show who you are. Do you have pictures in your house? You do? Yeah, say yes. Good. When you look to the picture, what do you see? Give me an example. Nature, flowers. How many of you look to the nail holding the picture? Nobody. The nail is ugly unless there is a picture hanging on the nail. Remember, we too many times want people to see the nail. We are supposed to hold Jesus' picture. So, so basically, Lord, let me show you to the point that people, when they see this picture, they don't see the nail. So, hallowed be thy name in my life now. Today, come into my life. I remember <clears throat> I was working, I was about 17 more or less, and I was working glass. And I was working glass, cutting glass. And I love it. It's, it's a hobby for me. I have a few diamonds, expensive tools that you can cut glass. There was a point in my life when I would cut two, three thousand pieces of glass a day. And so as I was working glass, um, the president of the cooperation, in that time in Romania, you would work for government, and it was called cooperation, and if you work in an institution, they would give you a certain salary, but if you work in a cooperation, they would take all the expenses away, and then they would take 60% for the government, and they would give you 40% whatever was left over, you know. Anyway, so I was working glass, and the president of the cooperation came to me, and he said, <clears throat> you don't come Saturdays. I said, I know. Why? You don't work Saturday, you don't work Sunday. I said, I follow the Bible. Give God what belongs to God and to Caesar what belongs to Caesar. So I don't work Saturday and Sunday. It's good for me. And he said, you got to work both days. I said, I'm willing to work Sunday. I don't care. But Saturday, no. He said, people are free in weekends. When they fix their homes, they come here to fix their window or whatever. We want you to come Saturday. I said, I cannot. You got to. I, I will not. You got to. Mm -mm. No, not going to happen. And he lost his temper. And he was foaming and spitting saliva. And he was angry and he turned red like the flag. And he, he was just talking nonsense. 
And he, I have the power. He was in the communist government. He was in the communist party and they had power. And people would fear them. <clears throat> I can terminate you and your life and your freedom. I'm going to teach you a lesson. You are going to work Saturday. You are going to give up that stupid religion. There is no God. I want to see. Where are you? Come here. Hit me if you can. And he was cursing God and cursing me and cursing the church. And I'm going to teach you a lesson. And my father taught me something. He said, you are nobody, but when you know God, you are the son of the king of universe. So he said, don't stand like this. Stand like this. And my father said, don't be afraid before them because you are going to lose Jeremiah 1. He, because you don't trust self, you trust God. And even if you die, die singing. So I told him, I said, hmm? I said, listen. <laughs> I said, I don't come Saturday, period. You can scream as long as you lose your voice. I don't come, period. I'm going to put you in prison. Go ahead. You lose your freedom. I said, okay, what else? We can kill you. I said, okay. He thought I'm going to melt down. I said, okay, what else? I said, well, nothing. I said, okay, go ahead and do it. Well, he got really angry. And he started planning how to put me in prison. In that time, there was a law that if you missed money in your institution, more than 2,000 either you pay or you go to prison. Well, <clears throat> when I would go to the storage house, to the warehouse, however we call, it, the, we call it the deposit, to get construction materials for my store, for my shop, every single time I would go there, there were boxes of glass. If you know how they are, you carry them on trucks vertical. You cannot put the glass horizontal because it's going to crack all over. Vertical, that's the rule. And the glass should be inside. No rain should get on the glass. When the rain and the sun hits, it gets like a white powder. Have you ever seen glass that has a white powder like salt? That's from the rain and sun. And it welds the glass together that you cannot use it anymore. And there were two boxes of glass staying outside in the rain and sun for several years. Winter and spring and summer and whatever. And that glass was all ruined gone and everybody would go around and get the good glass from inside and the boxes were rotten to the point that the finger would go through have you seen wood that is so rotten that you can do this okay <clears throat> that sabbath i didn't go to work that sabbath because we talk about hallowing sanctifying god's name in our life that sabbath he went to the storage to the warehouse and he got those two boxes of broken glass he put them in front of my shop. When I went to work Monday, he said, liar, when I brought this glass for you, it was good, but it rained and the sun hit and now look how it is. I said, yeah, sun last night. Okay. And <laughs> so I asked the workers, don't you tell him that he's wrong? We all know that this glass was already broken, but people mine more for their own skin. And sometimes they are jellyfish. And so they put their heads down because they are concerned with self. And they didn't take a stand for what is right. So he says, you see, you either pay for it. That was around 12, 13,000 dollars. I mean, dollars in Romania money. Or you go to prison. Well, I didn't have that type of money. So I told him, I said, listen, you can put me in prison. You don't make money. Or you can let me work harder and I'll make money for you. No, nah, I don't care for money. Now I want you in trouble. I want you to work Saturday and I will erase everything. You'll be free. I said, I'm not going to happen. <clears throat> he started the war. I went home and I prayed 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 day and night. And my father came to me and said, okay, what are you praying about? I said, well, this is the trouble. And my father said, remember, it's good to tell God your needs, but it's also good to make God the center. Pray. As Moses prayed, he said, you remember what Moses said when Israel made a golden calf and God said, step aside, I'm going to kill them and make you a big nation. Moses didn't say, oh, please forgive them. Moses said, they are a stubborn nation. They deserve to die. But what about your name? What are the nations going to say about you that you cannot deliver what you promised, that you don't have mercy and love, that you are not the God that you are work for your namesake. So all the nations will know that you are God. So my father said, sanctify God's name before them. You already prayed about you. Now pray about God. Be 
concerned with God's name. Be concerned with God's honor, with God's plan. Pray for God's name's sake. So I changed my prayer and I said, Lord, whatever he does to my freedom, I am willing to take it. But would you do something that your name would be sanctified before all those unfaithful people? And they may be communist, but they are going to learn that there is a God in heaven above and earth below that can do anything and he loves them too as he loves me. So I said, would you do that for your namesake? I got peace in a second. I knew that he's right there and he answered my prayer. So I praised him. I went to sleep. And then I went to work. When I went to work, he came angry. You go to prison. Today you got to pay. I said, listen, I have a deal for you. No deal. I said, just listen. I'm going to transport this broken glass back to the storage. And I'm going to bring good glass and double my work time day and night during the week. And he says, you are stupid. You cannot transport this because this is rotten. You break it when you transport it. He knew that it was rotten, you know. And I said, what do you care? He said, good point. Because if you transport it and you break it, then we don't have to eventually pay for it. You pay for it. And if you don't break it, you are going to work double for me. Do it. And he said, but if you break it, you pay for it or work Sabbath. I said, well, if I break it, I don't work Sabbath. I go to prison. Okay, okay, deal. <laughs> I called the driver. The driver came with a truck and the small crane that is between the cabin and the truck. And uh, imagine, this is the box. It has 220 meters. That's around uh, seven feet, more or less. And 180, that's about five feet. Okay? 22 sheets of glass, four millimeters each, around six, seven tons a box. You heard me? Okay. It is wood. Inside is the glass, the sheets. And it has two shoulders of wood here and here that you put the cable and then you put the hook and you can keep it vertical and put it in the truck vertical. So the driver came and the driver saw the wood and he said, uh -uh, I'm not going to touch it because then I pay for it. I said, okay, I'm going to write a paper that I take all the responsibility. Okay. He put the cables. Bzzz, bzzz. When he did that to rotate and put in the truck, the bottom came off and the glass, the glass came off the box. I didn't even have time to pray. I mean, I, do you have time when it falls? I mean, it takes a second. It's gravitation. The glass stopped in the air. And the box was moving in the wind and the glass was standing in the air. And there was nothing under. Six tons. And nothing above. And I started to shake. And the president of the cooperation was blue, yellow color. Like when you go to the dentist. And people on the street all stopped. The earth stopped moving. People stopped breathing. And the ladies that work in the offices there, everybody was, wow. And the driver, Nitsa Vasile is his name. He stopped. And for a few seconds, nobody moved. And I said in my mind, Lord, I'm just a kid. Why would you do that for me? And God in a second said, I didn't do it for you. I did it for my name's sake. And the driver said to me, what should I do? I said, I don't know. <laughs> Lower it down. We are not going to keep it this way forever. <laughs> and he said, probably we should. <laughs> so he started to lower. As, as he's lowering the box, the glass stands still until the glass gets all inside. And then they go together down. And the president said, leave. Leave this place. Leave this town. Leave my cooperation. You don't need to pay. You don't go to prison. Just don't curse me. I said, I... <coughs> Our... That doesn't mean that God always answers the way we want. But he does always answer honest prayers. He always answers in his time, in his way. The problem is that you don't have the patience and the faith to wait for his answer and to trust him enough and to have a connection with him the way we should. So <clears throat> our time is up. I got to finish. I got to be respectful of the time. Actually, it's a little past. <laughs> but we'll continue. Uh, it, unfortunately, we didn't finish. The, I, I want to finish the Lord's Prayer explaining every single point in it because it's, it's, it's life in it. 
is powerful life in it. And then I wanted tomorrow to focus a little on the life of Jesus, how he did it. Because if we understand how he did it and we follow him, we can do what he did. He said you'll do greater things, didn't he? Yeah. So basically, hallowed be thy name. Focus on God's name because he is worthy. In fact, Dr. Derek Morris says, if you watch the first part of the prayer, there are three words that repeat themselves, a, a word that repeats itself three times. Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. So priorities, it's not wrong to pray for your needs, but the matter is our priorities. God comes first. And the second part, give us today, forgive us, and do not lead us. You see, us, us, us. First God, and then you can pray for self. It's a matter of priorities. Who comes first in your life in everything? Okay, I think we stop right here, though we didn't cover much.